Sure, hi. So I'm just gonna take a few minutes to introduce you to the new journal uh, by Cambridge University Press. It's called Flow. Um, it's, as uh, Kathleen just mentioned, it's a sister journal to the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. And we're very happy about this and, and very lucky to benefit from the experience and the great reputation of, of the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. Um, this journal, uh, compared to Fluid uh, JFM, is an open access journal. It's gonna have shorter format papers. And the key of the journal is that it's focused entirely on applications of fluid mechanics. That is where fluid mechanics is leveraged to achieve either a concrete technology or some very practical insight into nature. Uh, so also natural phenomenon. Um, so again, we want to leverage fluid mechanics for the benefit of society or natural phenomenon. We're not, we won't have issues. As soon as we have good papers, we're going to publish them online. We've assembled a very strong set of editors who have very wide, uh, widely uh, different, um, yet in some cases overlapping uh, expertise. Um, and I, I'll list them here. I won't read through them. Um, we have a few different article types of standard research articles going to be relatively slow, 15 pages. Like JFM, we're going to uh, have a rapid section. So we call ours flow rapids um, and that uh, will offer shorter turnaround time. We're going to have something a little unique for journals uh, uh, in fluids, especially called case studies. So these are very ad hoc of one device or one phenomenon. Uh, uh, studies, and it could be from the point of view of industry, it could be a, a failure of a design, so very practical things. And then we have a couple types of reviews. Um, I'm just going to share one more slide with you, but basically we're working on this hypothesis that the fundamentals of fluid mechanics are very well covered by several journals, including and, and uh, journals like uh, the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. But we have a hypothesis that there's still a niche for a journal that's focused on the applications. And with this slide, I'd just like to um, summarize basically our, our proposal to you as potential authors and to readers. Um, the first is a shorter format, open access. So we think we can have a uh, target a very wide scientific audience, not just fluid mechanicians. Seconds for authors who are themselves fluid mechanicians or collaborate closely with them. Again, we hope to provide a much wider audience than traditional fluids journals while still benefiting from rigorous reviews from experts in, in fluids. So to readers of, of our articles, of, of our papers that are fluid mechanicians, we hope to offer you accessible introductions to other applications. So you might wanna read this journal to see what other applications you might apply your fluid mechanics knowledge to, to have impact so that your research can have impact. And then to readers outside of fluid mechanics, we hope to offer them an introduction to powerful tools of fluid mechanics. And to all, everyone, of course, we aspire to ha have very high quality assisting papers um, that leverage fluid mechanics, which is so uh, prevalent and ubiquitous. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Um, let me share my slide back again. Um, so Juan will stay with us and hopefully we can take questions at the end. Um, but just to let you know more about Journal of Fluid Mechanics um, and its start. So as I mentioned, uh, JFM was founded by um, Professor George Keith Batchelor in 1956. And this is an excerpt from what Professor Keith Moffat wrote in the memoirs for um, George Batchelor. Until 1956, there was no journal that was devoted to fluid dynamics in all of its experimental and theoretical aspects. He then goes on to say that Batchelor perceived that a need for a journal of a new kind, one that would include papers covering a full range um, for those dealing with the most fundamental aspects of the subject in fluid mechanics, right through dealing with the applications in all of the sciences. So JFM um, does have that fundamental aspect, the advance of new fluid mechanics, and will also accept um, papers covering the applications of the sciences. And I suppose what, uh, what FLOW does 
field covers new understanding in the new application and the impact, whilst JFM is looking on new advances in fluid mechanics. And that's the main difference between the two. Um, but going back to JFM, um, on the left here are all of the editors in chiefs um, that we've had since, um, since the launch of the journal in 1956. And we're very, very pleased today that uh, Professor Gray Worcester, who is the current JFM editor in chief, has been able to join us and will give us some of his insights of what, what he looks for in a paper. Um, but JFM started at the University of Cambridge and uh, Gray will tell us about that as well, about the connection between uh, JFM and DAM to the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics. And also um, Bachelor was also heavily involved with the European Mechanics Society when the journal was launched. Just a few statistics and submission trends with JFM. So you can see that the submission goes from strength to strength every year. And there's a strong growth, about 10 to 15% year on year. And this year in 2020, we've just hit over 2000 submissions already. And we've just closed our 2020 volumes with 975 articles and over 28,000 pages. So thank you very much to all of our authors, our referees, our readers um, that contribute to JFM. And the pie chart on the, um, on the right here shows um, our geographic distribution of our authors. So primarily our authors come from the US, the UK, France, China, Australia, Germany, India, Japan, Canada. So we want to increase more diversity around this link, ring and encourage you all to submit your papers to JFM and to FLOW. Here, uh, just to show you that JFM still remains one of the leading journals in the fluid mechanics field. Uh, JFM is in orange here, um, and you'll recognize some of these other leading journals as well. Um, but we are and maintain our very good reputation, um, and we want to um, you know, grow further and further increase the impact factor. That has been growing every year anyway, um, but to really maintain our lead here as the top premier journal um, in fluid mechanics. Um, here on this slide, I wanted to address some of the misconception. Uh, so it's often what I hear when I go to conferences, people tell me, oh, JFM is very slow. Um, so I just wanted to say that JFM is not that slow. And um, this is a, a graph for JFM Rapids. We aim to give you a decision within 30 days, which is about a month. Um, and we aim to publish, certainly on the Rapids side, we aim to publish a manuscript within three months. And okay, you know, with COVID and pandemic, sometimes we've been a bit slower, but you know, you should get your paper from submission to online within in the region of three months. And for a standard, uh, our times to publication is around nine months. And sometimes people say, oh, you take over a year to publish in JFM, which is not true. So on average, our times to publication is around from submission to getting online about nine months. And these are the different article types of in JFM. We have standard articles, we have rapids, uh, JFM perspectives are more like big reviews and uh, similar to the annual reviews of fluid mechanics. And then we also have a focus on fluids. Now I'd like to point out to Professor Gray Worcester. Um, but before I do that, let me introduce uh, the panelists. So we'd, we're really uh, pleased to join um, by the excellent panels um, of JFM editors. So we have Professor Gray Worcester, who is our editor in chief. Um, he's based at the University of Cambridge and his um, specialist area is in geophysical flow, uh, you know, flow re related to ice sheets, sea ice, climate change, and fundamentals of frost heave. We're also joined by Professor Hei Jun Choi. Um, he's based in South Korea at the Seoul National University. Um, and his uh, expertise is on turbulence flow control uh, CFD biomimetic engineering. We also have online on the panel today Kenta Kawahara, who is based in uh, Osaka University, and his expertise is on turbulent heat transfer. And also, we're joined by Professor Xia Kachinxia, who's based in Sustec in Shenzhen, and his expertise in, on the enhancement of scalar transport in turbulent flows, oceanic uh, mixing, and internal waves. Without further ado, uh, let me um, hand back to Gray Worcester, who's going to tell us a bit about uh, what he looks for as an editor-in-chief in JFM when he assesses a paper. 
So Kray, um, over to you. Thank you, Kathleen. And uh, hello to everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. It's uh, wonderful to see so many uh, people online. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes um, sort of musing on what it is that Jeff and Medicis look for uh, when setting a paper. And I think in order to understand that, it's good to understand uh, the history of the journal uh, a little bit. And uh, as Kathleen's already uh, alluded to, uh, before JFM came along, there were various journals in which you could find fluid mechanical research, uh, going through engineering journals, physical, uh, physics journals, and mathematics journals, so specialized journals in their own right, uh, and then society journals like the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, for example, you find a lot of the um, sort of late 19th, late 19th century, early 20th century uh, fluid mechanics. And uh, George Batchelor, as uh, Kathleen said, recognized that um, there was a, a space here really for um, a journal that brought together all these different uh, approaches to the study of fluid flow, which is a very rich and diverse subject. And uh, so the idea of the journal of fluid mechanics uh, was born. And I think to understand the nature of, of uh, JFM and uh, what it is that editors look for, it's worth reflecting on the nature of George Batchelor and where he was as a scientist. And uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, he founded the journal of fluid mechanics uh, at a very similar time, just three years before he also founded the uh, Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics in, in Cambridge. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that department because I think it gives us some insight into what George felt was important and what he wanted to reflect in JFM. So uh, DAMT is a department of mathematics, applied mathematics, uh, but uh, it was actually a splinter group and it split away not from the mathematics department, which existed, uh, before Dant came along, but it split away from the Cavendish Physics Laboratory. George Batchelor and G.I. Taylor um, and all these early uh, workers were there in the Cavendish, um, and I'm going to mention uh, G.I. Taylor in particular in just a moment. And throughout its history, the department has also had very close ties with the Department of Engineering in uh, Cambridge. And so you can see this sort of multidisciplinarity uh, coming through uh, with an emphasis on this um, interplay between physical understanding, mathematical um, interpretation, and engineering applications. And the other thing that's uh, almost unique, um, but very special, certainly very special about uh, DAMT, is that although it's a mathematics department, it includes a very significant, very large, large um, and significant uh, fluid mechanics laboratory uh, in its basement. I'll say a little bit about uh, G.I. Taylor because in fact a lot of what George uh, Batchelor felt was important uh, was guided by his very deep respect and admiration uh, for G.I. Taylor. And uh, I don't know how many uh, people know the history of G.I. but he started out really as a theoretical physicist. There's a lovely story where uh, he, he ran an experiment to see whether the young slit experiment, the sort of uh, fringes that you get in a diffraction grating, would uh, still work at very low light intensities, where really just one photon at a time would be traveling through the slits and uh, you know, forming the pattern on the other side. And this experiment was going to take uh, at least a month, maybe a few months. And so he set it all up in the laboratory and went sailing, which was a very popular pastime of, of his. And while he was out sailing, he uh, flew a kite off the back of his uh, yacht and made uh, some measurements of uh, atmospheric motions, uh, the winds and, and the sort of turbulence in the air. 
and uh, he came back and that was sort of the start of his fluid mechanical investigations. So he was a physicist by uh, background and uh, an experimental physicist in that regard. Uh, if you look at his early papers, he was a very adept mathematician. And you have to look at the paper on uh, taylor Coet flow, for example, to, to see that. And he was an engineer. Uh, one of the inventions, actually, of GI was the small anchor that uh, yachtsmen use, and you may be familiar with, that uh, writes itself and digs itself into the uh, seabed uh, in the manner of a plow. Uh, and that was GI's uh, invention. So let me get to the main topic of this talk. What is it that JFM uh, looks for? Um, and often people come to this and say, well, JFM is an applied maths journal. It's looking for mathematics. Um, but uh, others involved in fluid mechanics are more keenly involved with observations or measurements, or these days, increasingly, with uh, computation. But JFM is looking for uh, not specifically any of these, but rather uh, treats all of these aspects as tools, tools to lead us to an advance in fluid mechanical understanding. And that really is what uh, JFM is looking for, an advance in fluid mechanical understanding. That is uh, also motivated by, uh, by something other than um, the ability to solve an equation, for example. And this structure really gives us, I think, the structure of a paper. Uh, and JFM uh, has always looked for a very clear introduction, narrative introduction, that uh, motivates the problem to be looked at. The bulk of the paper is in this middle section. That's where you present the calculations that you did, either numerically or analytically, the experiments that you did and what measurements were taken. And then most importantly, uh, a conclusion. So when one's doing research, and I know this is particularly true perhaps of uh, younger researchers, PhD students, when they first come in, they're very, very focused on this middle section. That's the hard work, if you like. But um, it's good even if that hard work starts with a motivation and an idea of where one's going. But certainly at the stage when one comes to write a paper, I would say that one needs to start thinking about the conclusion. What is it that you would like the reader to understand once they've read your paper? And with that in mind, I think that guides the whole structure of the paper from beginning to end, because you're trying to lead the reader uh, from uh, the motivation towards an advance in uh, fluid mechanical understanding. So let's pick these two key ingredients apart a little bit, the uh, introduction and conclusion, the motivation and the advance. So let's think about the motivation. And I've put here a couple of examples. Uh, this is a um, off, often quoted statement. I don't know if it uh, was actually made by anyone or if it's just a bit of a joke, um, supposedly from a referee's uh, report, writing this paper fills an important gap in the literature. But you do read statements like that at the beginning of a number of papers. This seems to be a problem that no one's looked at before. Well, actually, that's not sufficient. Just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean that it needs to be done. It's not a sufficient motivation. Another sort of uh, structure that one sees is uh, represented by uh, the following. And I made this uh, statement up, but it sort of um, typifies uh, some submissions that I receive. We present measurements on something very specific, you know, the CX25B delta wing. I don't think that's a real thing. Uh, but I just uh, put it there. And that's really a case study, a single case study from which there may be very important measurements made that uh, are important for the designer and for the user of the product. Uh, but it doesn't lead to something necessarily uh, that is generalizable to other shapes of wing or um, uh, other uh, 
um, areas of flow mechanics. So I put these up as examples of inadequate uh, motivation for a JFM paper. On the other hand, I mentioned this paper. Uh, notice um, th th this was a paper that was uh, recommended to me when I was a PhD student many, many years ago now uh, to read as an example of a well-written paper. And that's something you might think of in advising your students. Pick out a paper that you've really enjoyed in the past that you think is really exemplary in, in the way that it describes its science. Uh, but here in terms of motivation, we see that there is a motivation, motivated by a variety of environmental phenomena. And then it goes on, we'll discuss a simple model of convection from sources placed in a finite closed region. So there's a level of abstraction there out of which one can develop an understanding that goes beyond the immediate application that had motivated the problem. So it's motivated by one thing, but the generality of what was determined within the paper can be applied to many other things. And I picked out a more recent example, but the same principle involves, uh, is involved that uh, the authors have started out by wanting to understand aspects of a range of applications, but in the paper itself, that's abstracted slightly into a study around something that is well characterized uh, in the laboratory and from which one could uh, determine uh, widely applicable um, fundamental understanding. And so I put these forward as examples of worthwhile motivation. So what about the end of the paper, the conclusions? So, it's a very, very important, perhaps the most important part of the paper and the thing that I look for when I first receive a paper, I read the abstract in order to see what the paper might be about, and then I read the conclusions. You know, have the authors uh, finished this paper by understanding something new that they want to convey to um, the, the wider community? And there are many, many submissions uh, that uh, simply present results. We, we carried out this study and here are the results of the study. But they don't consolidate that into a set of conclusions that uh, advance understanding. So it's important to identify what has been learned beyond the raw numbers of the uh, results of the experiment, the results of the comp uh, numerical computation, or the results of the analysis. And how can it be generalized? You know, that uh, a broad understanding can be applied to other things. So I think that's important to bring out. And any of these methods of uh, attacking fluid mechanical problems, analysis, experimentation, numerical computation, uh, can be generalized by identifying what fundamental principles are involved, it may be that several case studies can be consolidated through the use of scaling that not only allows you to understand something general between those case studies, but allows the results to be extrapolated to um, other situations. Particularly important in geophysics, of course, where uh, the motivation, the application is on the large scale but often the understanding comes from an appropriately scaled laboratory experiment on the small scale. The other thing is, you know, is there a change of behavior in what's been observed? And if there is a change of behavior, have the critical conditions been determined? Ideally in terms of dimensionless parameters so that this extrapolation can go on. Similarly, can you use your results to optimize a process? So not just this is how this process works, but if I wanted to make it better, um, how would I go about so doing that? And then very importantly, don't be uh, afraid of saying what your paper can't do. What are the limitations of your study? We all make approximations in fluid mechanics, or you know, we're limited by 
uh, the range of parameters that we can explore in uh, a laboratory setting, for example. So what are the limitations? How far can the results be uh, taken? And that's an, uh, a very important contribution of what you're doing. So in closing, let me try and uh, answer the question a little more directly. What does the JFM Edis look for when assessing a paper? Uh, well, he's looking for positive endorsement from referees. And that's an important statement. Uh, it's not sufficient that the editor doesn't receive negative reports. They, they actually have to be positive reports. So reports that are simply acquiescent, well, sort of shrug of the shoulders, this is okay, I can't see anything wrong with this, somehow isn't enough. The referee has to recognize within the paper some significant advance and say, this is a worthwhile paper because. And then something about the process. Uh, JFM is a peer-reviewed journal, and here I've emphasized the word reviewed. Uh, papers are sent out to referees who act as expert witnesses uh, reporting to the editor. And it is the editor who makes the decision on the paper, guided by those expert referees. So that, I think, does need to be un understood by uh, authors, that uh, the, the uh, reviewers are not a jury or a panel who are casting votes. We've got two referees in favor and one referee who's negative. Uh, therefore, your paper should be accepted because you've got two versus one. Uh, those referees' reports are advisory and uh, will, in the, a good referees' report, will give reasons for the decisions, for the recommendations that are made to the editor. I think this paper is not sufficient because it doesn't do this, that, or the other. And it's for the editor to assess those reports from the expert witnesses who have um, given their opinions and to come to a conclusion about whether this paper should be accepted or not. But then if I change the emphasis slightly, JFM is a peer-reviewed journal. And at the end of the day, uh, the editor is indeed guided by those expert witnesses. It is the whole community that uh, contributes to um, what seems to be uh, helpful and uh, really advances uh, the understanding of the community in fluid mechanics. And so with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for listening, but also thank you to uh, the many of you that I know ex uh, exist who are listening today who have refereed uh, for the journal. Uh, your work is invaluable uh, and it really is a, a great benefit to uh, the whole worldwide community, um, as well, of course, as to the journal itself in maintaining its high standards. So thank you very much, and I'll conclude there. <laughs>